because they were making money. There was no place to spend it, so you <laughs> I guess the bank did pretty well. <laughs> The lack of amenities abound, but it was to be the Columbia Basin environment that would cause the growing population the most trauma. The wind blew so much around here, and it was so aggravating for the people in construction out working because the sand and dirt was blowing all over them while they were trying to do a job. But uh, they got to call on those winds then termination winds and some of the construction people would say well it was E.I. DuPont but from now on it's just E. DuPont because I is leaving. Uh, on Fridays when the wind blew we had a, <laughs> we had all these resignations so we were busy getting their their checks and whatever else ready for them so they could take off as fast as they could get out of there and that would have been nice. I lots of times thought I might do that, but then my husband didn't want to, so I didn't either. <laughs> Before streets, grass, or trees, when the termination winds would blow, my mother served our meals in the pots with the lids on and our plates turned upside down. After saying grace, we would then turn the plates over when it came your turn to dish up. There was no need for pepper because you never knew how much to put on with all that dirt moving through the house. Recollections from Jim Brasina. Our first house was a single bedroom prefab. And boy, it was <laughs> really something. No lawn, no nothing. Crack under the door about a half inch wide and so forth. But uh, we survived it rather nicely. Uh, everybody had a lettered house. <laughs> I think ours was a Y, <laughs> one of the ranch houses. Uh, there were a thousand of them all alike. And if you were. Uh, Coming home late at night, you wanted to be sure you got the right one. As the first houses were built in Richland, the B houses and F houses were all the same, with the same furniture for each house. We were assigned the first house on Farrell Lane. There were two B houses side by side. My dad worked with a man who lived in the second B house on the same side we lived in. About a week after we moved in, my mom heard the front door close and the closet open for someone to hang up a jacket. She thought it was my dad, and they were carrying on a conversation with yes and no answers. She went into the living room to give my dad a kiss, and it was the neighbor man. For two months, he repeated coming into our house, and only recognized he was in the wrong house when one of us appeared. Plants were hard to come by then, and Mother arranged to find a flower pot and put it on the front step. This let him know he was at the wrong house. Recollections by Geneva Hammer. It was a benevolent despotism on the part of the government. Uh, they, <laughs> they did everything for you, uh, but they required that you toe the line and do the things that they wanted. Uh, and it's true, if you wanted to, they would come out and change a light bulb for you, but people didn't ask for that kind of service. Uh, um, but they did maintain everything. They painted the houses. Uh, they, they took care of everything. In the spring of 1944, Camp Hanford was abandoned as the project went critical. The once sleepy community of Richland Village had now transformed into the fourth largest city in the state. The government built houses, shops, and offices lined the once barren landscape. But life in the community was far from ordinary as the code of silence echoed through the town. People today do not understand the, the, the war feeling, the uh, realization that something going on in Hanford was really significant. And there was a strong feeling that uh, we were the workers back home to uh, help the whole situation along. And it was a pretty serious thing. We never talked about that at all, and I don't think people quite understand that. But this was the war effort. If you didn't have to say anything, you didn't. You know, it was just, it was just a, matter of, a way of life. Uh, the real emphasis was keep your mouth shut and don't talk about what you do. The secrecy was accepted and that's just the way it was. One of my first assignments was lecturing to employees entering the first secured reactor area on the need to keep mum about the work on this vital secret defense work. I of course had no idea what the secret was that I was admonishing them to keep. Recollections from George Barr. And of course you'd go to a movie, there would be a big sign on the screen, silence means security. We didn't know what to talk about. We didn't know what we were doing. 
had no clues what we were doing, except there was an enormous lot of concrete being poured. Matter of fact, there's a lot of rumors of what was made at the plant. And this is a little sidelight. Uh, apparently there was a, a show and tell along the schools and one of the kids said, I know what they're making at Hanford. And she said, what are they making? She said, toilet paper. And uh, she said, how do you know that? He says, my dad brings home two rolls of toilet paper in his lunch bucket every day. I remember going to school at the old Hanford school on half-day shifts because there were too many students and lack of space and teachers. And the day our teacher promised no test if we would just help her find her lost security badge. Recollections by Virginia Poe Morrison. Yeah, we didn't talk about reactors. We talked about a pile or the unit. And we didn't talk about plutonium. We talked about the product. Everything had a code name. And the separations activities carried out in the 200 areas. And this is the way the whole plan was set up. Putting the test reactor in the 305 building required a lot of planning, not only in the design, but also the procurement of the fuel rods. It was necessary to maintain the secrecy of the contents of the shipments. Special railroad cars were designed with false floorboards. The rods were stowed under the false floor, and the floor was covered with hay and loaded with horses. When the train arrived at the 300 area, the cars were open and the horses released. Then, under the security of night, a crew would carefully remove the rods. Because of the massive area of the Hanford project, the arrival of horses did not create any particular interest. It was an accepted fact that the government does strange things, and perhaps because of the known shortage of beef, the government was going to graze the horses on the land and build a slaughtering plant next to the ice house at the original Hanford town site. Recollections by Fran Oskowicz. Nowadays, uh, it's a different story. We could never, ever have accomplished what they did at that time, given the restrictions we have now. It never would have happened, not, not the way it did on, at, in 1943, 1945. In the darkness of a desert morning, on July 16, 1945, the atomic age is born. Thunderbolt gives a preview of its destructive force. Great patriotism, just tremendous patriotism, because they said it's going to help the war effort. But, uh, no, we won the war, and believe me, if we had not had developed this bomb ourselves, we would never know uh, free land that we've known. And I think all young people should realize that. And I think we, people were much more trusting of the government back then than uh, they do now. Uh, it was, uh, well, you felt that, that they were trying to do the, the right thing and, and uh, that they were, we were working towards, uh, towards a good end. The war to end all wars was over. What to do with this desert community that had been created? Nuclear technology was now real. With continued tensions throughout the world and a country looking for new forms of power generation, Hanford would live on. Homes were lost and families displaced, but history had been written, and the once quiet Columbia Basin would never be the same. You had no family here, so your friends were sort of, sort of your family. I know my son has said that many times. There were some of our friends whose children he grew up with, and he feels closer to them than he does any cousins. And I said after I got here and got, got a, uh, acclimated to the to the sandstorms and, and the wind and so forth, I said, well, maybe five years. And uh, 54 years later, I'm still here. We decided we'd stay for six months. We didn't say which six, we're still here. <laughs> but it's different, and it's a lovely place to live.